I joined the Jawaharlal Nehru University in October 1970 for my PhD. And uh, at that time, the university was just starting and the first batch of students in the various schools uh, were admitted. So the first task which we took up in the university was the formation of a students uh, union. Since it was a new university, uh, a central government university uh, set up by an act of parliament, uh, in one sense there was an advantage. We could start from afresh. So we could decide what type of students union should be there. And I think that's where the uh, uniqueness of this uh, union was uh, formed, which is that we decided that this is a union which should be formed purely out of the voluntary efforts of the students themselves. So we conducted a campaign within the student community on the need for a students union and there was a heated discussion or debate which lasted for six months uh, in all the then existing schools in the uh, university. There were only uh, three major schools at that time. Uh, the fourth school, the School of Life Sciences, was a very small school. It was only the School of International Studies, School of Languages and the School of Social Sciences. So uh, two, three rounds of general body meetings were held on the nature and structure of the union. We said this is a self-sustaining union. The students will have uh, uh, purely, the students will set up the union, run the union, and it should not be uh, set up by the university authorities. So the constitution of the union, uh, the making of that, what type of structure, whether it should be separate unions for each school and then a federating body or a single union with representation from all the uh, schools. This became one of the main points of discussion. Finally, it was settled in favor of a single union, a unitary body in which there will be a representation or elected representatives from all the uh, constituents, that is the schools of the uh, university. Uh, the first elections to this union under the constitution uh, was conducted in October 1971. This was the first election. And after that, there have been these elections continuously uh, uh, without a break except in one or two, as you know, instances like the emergency and then there was later a closure of the university and then there was, I think, much later because of the uh, Supreme Court intervention, court intervention about the Lingdo committee. There were some interruptions. Otherwise, the union has been a continuous uh, process and a body which existed uh, as a vibrant expression of the students. Uh, there was also, uh, the constitution was also framed by a committee elected by the students and then the constitution was ratified by all the general bodies of the schools. So this was, as I said, a process which took six months but I think it was in one sense uh, seminal in developing the consciousness of students that there should be a student union, an organization of students which will be democratic, which will represent all sections of the students and which will be self-governing. This was the idea of the students union. The JNU Students Union was formed at a time when internationally there was a great ferment and turmoil among the students all around the world. There were a large number of student movements which had swept the uh, world. There was the famous uh, May 1968 French student revolt. 
there was the big student demonstrations and protests in the United States of America, in Britain, all over Europe against the Vietnam War. And there was a general radicalization of an entire generation of students in the late 1960s. So that impact was also there in uh, India. And the JNU being a central university, getting students from all over the country. Uh, uh, I think the juncture was important that there was this international radicalization of students and there was also the domestic situation where in the late 60s we saw <coughs> increasing student uh, protests and activism against uh, the difficulties they faced in education, in the general difficulties that they were there, in the economic situation. Students had started becoming more active and also engaging in political activities. So the JNU Students Union uh, reflected some of uh, this uh, student awareness and activism. Uh, I had before coming to JNU did my postgraduate uh, studies at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland and there uh, I was drawn into the student activities and agitations against both the Vietnam War which is a very big movement in the, among the students in Britain and secondly the anti-apartheid movement, the movement against the apartheid racist regime in South Africa. Uh, I was active in that and in fact I was rusticated from the university for uh, our joining some protests inside the university against the apartheid system. So uh, seeing the nature of the students union there, I realized that it had become very much uh, part of the establishment, uh, the university establishment. So uh, I was determined that the students union here should not be an extension of the university authorities. It should not be one of the institutions uh, officially uh, run by the university authorities. Uh, we were fortunate in the fact that uh, the first vice chancellor of JNU, G. Parthasarathy, accepted our approach when we said that we'll form the union, we'll produce the constitution. You just see that every student uh, pays a fee uh, which will go to the union, that will finance the union activities. Uh, he readily accepted that. There was no attempt uh, on the part of the vice chancellor and the university authorities at that time to try and in any way um, influence or um, interfere in the process of formation of the uh, union. Uh, as I said, this very uh, activity of six months to form the union set the political tone on the campus because the students realized that uh, they could themselves be part of st student activities, decide on student issues, take up matters which affect students not only in the university but in society as a whole and that laid the basis for a very strong democratic uh, organization like the Students Union. And uh, from right from the formation of the Students Union, I think in 71 itself, uh, we had our first strike in the university. Uh, and then it was followed up by uh, the struggle the Students Union launched for the a new admissions policy, that is to see that uh, the university gets students of uh, a diverse background from all over the country, from all regions, from all socio-economic backgrounds. Uh, we struggled hard to, actually we, I can claim the Students Union shaped the admission policy of JNU which lasted for a pretty long time, uh, which also changed the character and nature of the university in many ways because we got started getting students from 1972-73 who came from backgrounds, uh, deprived socio-economic backgrounds which normally could not have come 
to Delhi. Uh, they could not have come to Delhi and study. But we managed that because of the weightages we gave to all these uh, factors. So I think uh, that was the uh, foundations of a very strong uh, student movement in JNU, which made it in one sense unique. Then before the emergency, the as I said, uh, it's a period of great ferment and turmoil internationally and in, in India among the student community. And various movements led by students uh, erupted. The two most well-known are the Gujarat Navnirman movement, which was launched uh, against the state government, against corruption uh, in the government of the chief minister by students and the student movement succeeded eventually in toppling the chief minister of the state and the second movement which had wider uh, overtones was the JP movement which was uh, started in Bihar uh, but soon spread uh, to the entire north India and uh, both uh, were clear cases where the students uh, were fighting not on just their demands, but it had clear political aims, uh, raised political slogans or demands, and it's, it showed that students can act as catalysts for a wider uh, political movement in the country. And uh, as you know, the JP movement uh, was uh, was the in nonsense, the sparking of or the predecessor for the imposition of the emergency. Though officially the emergency came because Mrs. Indira Gandhi was disqualified uh, from her uh, being elected from Rai Bareilly. But the crisis that built up and the wide opposition unity which developed on the basis of this uh, JP movement posed a serious threat to the government and it was in order to save the government and to save the ruling party that emergency was imposed in uh, the year 1975. So uh, the JNU Students Union naturally when emergency was imposed uh, immediately came out uh, against the emergency and for them the emergency was not an abstract thing because immediately uh, the police were active in searching out leaders of the union to arrest them. The president of the Gen Students Union uh, was arrested eventually and kept in jail throughout the period of the emergency under the Maintenance of Internal Security Act. and. Uh, Many other students were uh, arrested by the police after they raided the hostels. Uh, I think I don't know the exact date, but just within one or two days after emergency was imposed. Uh, they were searching and looking for particular student leaders. Uh, they couldn't find all of them. Some of them were detained. Uh, but since from then, the university administration also uh, started cracking down. Uh, uh, the students union president was in jail so the others in the union continued to oppose the emergency and the measures taken by the admi administration. So uh, one of the leaders of the union, uh, Ashoklata Jain, she was uh, rusticated from the university for issuing a leaflet uh, there was an arrest of one of our activists on the campus by the police and uh, they came and literally abducted him from the campus. Uh, so there's a strike and a call, uh, the union gave a call for strike and protest against that. So she was rusticated. So despite all that, the students union continued to be active. And uh, around the country at that time, I had uh, I had been the president of the union the year before in 72-73 and uh, sorry I get my dates mixed up 73-74 <laughs> so uh, 
uh, after that, this uh, I became the president of the Students Federation of India, the All India President. So when the emergency was uh, declared, uh, I happened to be in Kolkata ad attending a meeting of the SFI. So when I returned, uh, I sub subsequently learned that they had issued a warrant for me on an old case. Again, it was a case uh, during one of the All India Bands. We had closed down the highway or the road opposite the campus and the put, there was a, some trouble with the police. So they had filed a case then. So they were using such cases and then when they arrest you, they put you into the preventive detention. So I had to avoid that arrest. So I stopped functioning uh, openly over ground. But as president of the student uh, SFI, I continued to move around the country uh, and organize the work of the uh, Students Federation. Uh, we wish to issue underground leaflets and uh, handbills to students in the campuses and colleges. And in some places, we could even organize uh, protests uh, in a wider scale, like in Kerala and uh, one or two other places. Uh, six of our central leaders were detained under the MISA, the Maintenance of Internal Security Act, uh, including Manik Sarkar, who was the Joint Secretary of the SFI at that time, including Kodiri Balakrishnan, who was one of the Joint Secretaries of the SFI uh, in Kerala, all later became important political leaders. So six of our leaders were under the MISA, and many others were arrested on other uh, cases and uh, not under MISA, but they would be kept in jail for short periods and then let out on bail, etc. But that uh, did not uh, prevent us from uh, uh, continuing with our activities in the, uh, on the student front. Uh, as far as JNU is concerned, uh, uh, it remained in the forefront of this uh, anti-emergency resistance because it, it was a compact university. It was, uh, the, the, there was almost universal opposition to the emergency among the students, uh, irrespective, except for a small uh, unit of the Congress, NSUI. All others, everybody else was against the uh, emergency. So uh, it became an important center and we could put out the information about the protests and resistance outside also. Uh, in the run-up to the uh, emergency, that is I'm talking about the early 70s, uh, you see there were three streams in the student movement, opposition streams. There was the ABVP, which was the RSS uh, student organization. There was the, in the North India particularly, there was the socialist Samajwadi Yuvjan Sabha, uh, which, was, which had influence in states like Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, etc. And the third was the left stream, in which the SFI was the main force. And there was uh, the AISF, which was uh, relatively smaller at that time. So these three streams were there. And uh, before the emergency, the anti-Congress and the anti-government sentiments which built up on the, on the whole range of government policies uh, and the repress, repression that the government unleashed against protests. There was the railway strike, very historic railway worker strike in 74. Uh, I think it lasted for nearly three weeks and mass arrests were there of railway workers and we used to go to the railway colonies in solidarity to hold protests and they would try to arrest us also at that time. So the, 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 the students uh, organizations uh, were working in tandem with the general uh, protests and the anti-Congress uh, democratic 
movements which were developing at that time. Uh, but RSS, uh, the ABVP was had a clear-cut ideological position which could be easily identified and recognized and we were the two poles apart, the ABVP and the SFI, AISF on the other side. So in such a situation, when the JP movement developed, uh, the slogan they gave was all in unity, let us all unite. Uh, for us, it was difficult for us to accept that because we knew behind this facade of all in unity, the main force in that movement was the ABVP and the RSS. So we took the position, yes, we should work, try to have uh, a united movement, but the way it can be done is you conduct your movement and we'll conduct our movement. Uh, parallel, you see. Uh, we cannot join hands and be in the same uh, uh, platform. Uh, you take up your demands and fight, I mean, your s slogans and fight, or raise your issues, and we will also simultaneously take up our own fight. So we refuse to join hands with the uh, JP movement. In one, in, if you look at it from hindsight now, we were correct because. It was that movement which the ABVP and the RSS used effectively to establish its overall uh, hegemony or dominance in the anti-Congress movement, particularly in the North. Uh, though they could not uh, do it on their own, they always needed a figure. At that time it was Jay Prakash Narayan. Later on they tried to do the same thing with VP Singh, but we foiled it. Because we said we'll be with you, but no question of having BJP or uh, uh, these uh, their fronts or organizations with them. So this uh, there was a cl more clear-cut ideological uh, differentiation within the students. Though we were also fighting the Congress, the ABVP was fighting the Congress government at that time, uh, but. We, we, we never agreed to have any united platform uh, with them. I remember when uh, Arun Jaitley was the AP, uh, DUSU president. He got elected in 1974. And he came with a delegation of uh, ABVP leaders to meet me to request me to join a convention to be organized by the DUSU, you see. Uh, against the uh, government. So I said, no, we can't do that. You do your thing, we'll do our thing. You see? Because we knew that ABVP will be running the whole show. You see? So uh, uh, our effort was to ensure that uh, while we fight the Congress government, we, while we oppose the Congress government's policies, uh, we will not give any leeway to the right fo forces at that time. Uh, the right-wing student organizations to to try to get legitimacy by joining hands with us. So uh, there was no question of United Front act tactics of joining hands with the ABVP, even though uh, during the emergency uh, we all faced the similar attacks and repression. The only area we agreed was when the question of civil liberties, when the civil liberties platform it came, we said yes, we'll come to that civil liberties platform because there the question will be uh, strike down these draconian laws, ensure democratic rights of citizens, restore civil liberties, uh, scrap the constitutional amendment they brought, the 42nd constitutional amendment during the emergency, which further restricted uh, parliamentary democracy. On such issues, we would be able, we'll come on to a platform, but otherwise we would not have any uh, truck with the ABVP. So I think uh, from then onwards, this struggle has been uh, going on between, uh, yes, an alternative to the Congress government uh, cannot be an all in unity comprising the extreme right to the left, you see. Uh, that was one of the issues which we had to clearly take a position. So the entire period of the emergency, 
actually uh, again was though there was not that type of uh, open revolt and big protests among the students but it also uh, radicalized us, uh, that generation of students because they understood the, the the threats to democracy which can come from within the system you see uh, they could, uh, it helped them to understand the nature of the state we have in india which can easily uh, slip into an authoritarianism you see uh, so uh, the post emergency situation as you know the, the congress suffered a massive defeat in the elections and uh, the new janta party government came to power but as we ex uh, expected the unity of all these parties uh, which was uh, encompassed in the janta party uh, that was utilized by the rss at that time there was no bjp jansang had joined them they utilized it they were in government and they were able gradually to appropriate the space of these other bourgeois secular parties you see they appropriated that which process we are seeing the final uh, outcome today which is uh, uh, the B bjp rss has been able to uh, encroach and finally take over the what was then the opposition space as far as the fight against congress is concerned and now becomes a dominant uh, political party uh, post emergency uh, our the student movement made rapid gains also big expansion took place of the student movement if you see the growth of the sfi you'll find there's a qualitative leap post 1977 because of the role that we played during the emergency we got wider recognition among the students and it also helped us to reach new sections and new areas of the students uh, after the emergency and uh, it is the post emergency situation really which also gave the sfi its true all india character we held our first national convention on educational policy in delhi after the emergency here in mavlankarol that's the first all india convention in the real sense organized by the sfi you see otherwise we used to work only in the different states you see uh, so the becoming an all india organization taking up issues of students of an all india character and taking up all other related issues you see uh, this was this became the norm for the sfi in the post emergency period we got a wider space to operate in. and uh, before that our sfi headquarters was used to be in calcutta uh, and uh, we shifted that to delhi after the emergency in 1978 so uh, the sfi is functioning as an all india student organization developed in uh, the post uh, emergency period so um, uh, talking about the mobilization inside jnu uh, uh, we, we know the instances of uh, you know uh, the, the student union president giving a speech which results in you know, uh, calling off any convocation that will be happening in the campus then uh, there was uh, there were instances of you know burning the certificate the degree certificate during the emergency as a protest okay. then there was uh, you know you mentioned that you know, I used to uh, steal the milk from warden's houses when the supply of mm. milk was there was a story it says that you know students used to uh, steal the uh, no, no. milk that goes to uh, the warden's houses because the mm. quality of milk supplied to the student was bad and so these kind of Uh, instances inside the no in the case of the convocation you see in the early years of jnu what is different as i said from other universities since it was a new university we got the opportunity to intervene and in the whole discussion on what should be jnu what sort of university should jnu be so first i said we started with this jnu act you know is act of parliament 
says this will be a national university. Its preamble says it will have a national character. We said your university doesn't have that national character. We produced the figures of admissions in uh, 71 and said, look, especially in the School of Social Sciences at that time, uh, 60 to 70 percent of the students were from Delhi. You see. Uh, and uh, we showed in some centers, they were from three colleges in Delhi. We, we got those figures, uh, like the history center. You see. So one was uh, what the concept of JNU itself. We intervened. So what happened when the convocation was, the first convocation was held, uh, they called Bisham Sani, who was a very well known, I mean, sorry, not Bisham Sani, uh, his brother. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Bisham Sani, the actor. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's Bisham Sani. Anyway, I'll tell you the right name. The, the very well-known actor, progressive person. So we, we had no objection to his being called. You see. But we said that in the university, just like the vice chancellor has a role, the president of the union must also be allowed to address the convocation. You see. Uh, so this became a tussle. Finally, he was allowed. And this was the second president of the union at that time, V.C. Koshi. So after he made this speech, after that they said, we won't hold any more convocations <laughs> to avoid the president of the union addressing the convocation. So they themselves decided, we will not hold any more convocations. You see. Uh, we've said that all decision-making bodies of the university must have student representation. So in the first struggle which I mentioned when we went on strike, one of the demands was give us a representation in the academic council, in the executive council, etc. So finally they gave us representation in the academic council. I was the first representative of the students as an ex officio president of the thing and they were actually, I think uh, from each school there was one representation apart from that. So there were four or five of us. And there I moved the first resolution ever for reservation for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe. It was not there. I said, you are a central government university, you are statutorily bound. You see. So uh, there was some resistance from some quarters, but finally uh, everybody said, you are right, you have, we have to have it. And then the reservation for CST was implemented. Because it was the students' union president who moved the resolution for introduction. So at all stages, we were able to intervene at that time. And a little more time, if the emergency had not come, we would have gotten to the executive council also. Because they had given a commitment uh, that we will uh, have a student representation in the executive council also. So in one sense, because it was a new university, secondly, as I said, because we had... Uh, vice Chancellor at that time with a vision, uh, G. Parthasarathy, we could get many things done. For example, the first time we made the demand, it looks uh, now, we said the mess bill should not be beyond 100 rupees a month. You see, uh, it was going up to 130, 40, 50, and all that. So I remember one of the Communist Party leaders who met me. He saw the chartered demands we were raising. He said, you think of going to have socialism in JNU? You are making such absurd demands. Where will you get all these demands? I said, no, in JNU it will be possible. And sure enough, Parsati agreed. We used to have 100 rupees ceiling. The mess bill would not go beyond that. Otherwise, the university had to subsidize the mess bill. We managed that. We said all students must get merit come mean scholarships. Parsanthi managed it from the UGC. I don't know how he committed. I mean, all the students who deserved, needed it, he, he got them scholarships, you see. So the uh, first, because of the new university, it was a settled government university, Indira Gandhi was also interested in showing that it's a showpiece university at that time. We decided we will intervene and decide also how to shape it, you see. That was the background. You talk a lot about organizing particularly. Now it's a new university formed a central university. 
how is the experience of working as a very partisan student activist? Because this question has always been there later half when new social movements started to evolve more about the you know independent left versus the partisan left. So did were there any instances of that kind during that or were it very much a binary and or a power division between ABVP Congress? No, no, things? because when we st as I said when we started. Our first student activism was regarding the formation of a union. There was no student organizations involved. You see, nobody, none of us were representing any organization. We consciously decided that we should not, when the, especially when the students' union formation was being discussed, we should not put our viewpoints as belonging to any student organization. So the the SFI was not even in the f uh, field at that time, you see. We, we formed the SFI later, you see. Uh, there were a group of us who were belonged or se at least thought we should be in the SFI, but we didn't form an SFI unit and conduct activities as the SFI. That is why when the first election was held, we s chose a person who I knew politically had nothing to do with the left, you see. But we chose him because he took a very firm stand on the formation of a union. He came from a very conservative background from Uttar Pradesh and he stood firmly with us because I told you there was a sharp division about uh, having a single union or a federating body and he had taken a very strong stand for the So we said he'll be our ca candidate as what? As an independent. He didn't represent any organization. It's in the second election also, the SFI was formed, but the SFI decided to support another independent candidate, a so-called independent. That person was much closer to the SFI, but we said you stand as an independent because we want to get the widest unity around the student. He fought against an NSUI candidate at that time. There was no ABVP then. So we defeated the first time uh, NS, a candidate of an organization stood in the second election. Uh, it, was, it was defeated. And after that, only in the third election, when I stood, that also you'll be surprised to know, I was an independent candidate supported by the SFI ASF. <laughs> uh, as an independent candidate. Because first we wanted the credibility of the union that the union is not being formed just because some organizations want to uh, control it or get elected. And then inevitably the ideological and political differentiation took place. All those who understood that these fellows are of the left, uh, what you would now call the partisan left, but we, uh, those days it was those who were of the organized left. You see, so all the others got together and formed a thing called the free thinkers. Now, the free thinkers are a very strange uh, conglomeration. They had students from the so called uh, ultra left to the right, but all united in the thing. We had to fight this organized left, you see. So, you even had Trotskyites <laughs> there who would be in, among free thinkers, and you would have people who were only interest was to somehow join the civil service, you see. But they all were united saying this organized left should not be allowed to take over. And organized left means totalitarianism. This is what will happen, what's happening in the Soviet Union, what's happening in China, you see. Uh, democracy will be finished. So, uh, the free thinkers, you see. So, this was the binary for a quite a long time between the SFI and the ISF on one side and the free thinkers on the other. Later on, the free thinkers differentiated and split off and became different organizations. Charles and pamphlets that would have come out during your time since, you know, as you said, that you wanted a much wider reach and the yeah. acceptability of a union first before any yeah. organization coming. Yeah. So, what kind of content would the student union or the aspirant candidates would? Well, we took up certain basic themes, you see, uh, basic, what I would say, principles for having a democratic student movement. So what would happen, as I told you, this is a period when there was a lot of 
turmoil outside campuses. You see, uh, uh, Namnivan movement. The Namnivan movement was political. So we told, we used to tell students, your student movement cannot be apolitical. Why, why is it necessary for the student movement to have politics? Then what type of politics? You see, uh, if you are against corruption, you see, you take a stand. You see. If you are against repression, state repression uh, of democratic rights, you will take a stand. You see. So we brought in uh, the parameters or goals of a student movement within the framework of an overall left and democratic sort of, you know, uh, movement. How? What is this place? This is the type of student movement that is required. From there we went onwards, you see. So once students accepted this, then we would proceed. So you'll find the content of the leaflets and the uh, material we put out was very much tied to the wider social economic uh, issues and concerns uh, which we had as a left organization and placing JNU in that context. For the, so what we would say is JNU is a university funded by the central government that is public money, public resources. Why is it should be in the hand of, for a privileged few? The elite, you see, uh, who want to come here and then go to the join the civil service or get a good job in the private sector, you see. So, uh, what about students who are studying in a school in, say, uh, Jharkhand of those days, there is still Bihar, or in Odisha, you see, will they get an opportunity to come and study here? What is preventing them? Do they have the means? So, do you, you have to provide the economic means? You see, uh, are they socially discriminated or oppressed? So you have to overcome, you have to give weightage for that. We weave in these issues, which were all issues concerning wider society, you see. So we always took up such issues, linked it to the thing. And at that time, as I said, there was a very strong anti-imperialist uh, consciousness, one mainly because of Vietnam War which by the way ended in 19 again uh, 75 uh, i remember from jnu when we heard that saigon had fallen to the vietnamese liberation forces we marched all the way the hot summer uh, all the way from jnu to prithuraj road where the vietnam uh, embassy was and there was a big celebration there i don't know what i think 200 of us students marched to uh, that because we had played an active role, uh, uh, the SFI, in the anti-Vietnam, I mean anti-war demonstrations, solidarity. So uh, we got the students involved. You see. Uh, when the railway workers, I said, were on strike, we took stu JNU students uh, to railway colonies where they, there was a reign of terror of the police to just boost the morale of the railway workers and their families. Suddenly we'll go up here then shout slogans supporting. So we got students involved. Uh, the first ever action, in fact, in, uh, as JNU students uh, was, I don't know whether you know, there's a Sapru house. There's a, there's a uh, now the IC, the Indian Council of World Affairs, Barakamba Road. There's a library there. One day house that was part we used to use the school of international studies was located nearby in those days it was an institution which preceded the jnu it was, so we used to use that library and we used to live in the hostel behind uh, and edward heath was the british prime minister who paid an official visit to india and he was to make an address at the sapro house auditorium so all our students were PhD research scholars. So everybody thought, good thing they are going there. We told them all, when he starts speaking, get up and start shouting down at apartheid. British government stop up supporting the apartheid system in South Africa. So they got up and 20 or so, 25 of them started shouting. Then the police had to come and remove them. They were arrested, all of them. This was the first ever action done by JNU students ever, I mean, in the history, because that was the first time such an incident happened. But they were kept in the police station, and finally G. Parsati himself went to the police station to get them released. 
Exactly. So we got the students involved. Uh, this is not a question of whether you are SFI anybody. This is a fight against racism, against apartheid, against human rights violation. So you should take a stand. You are all students of international studies. You know what's happening. And I remember some of them later on, <laughs> one of them became uh, a top uh, officer in intelligence, the government intelligence agency. The person who was arrested that time, he was uh, shouting slogans and got arrested. So we got students involved right from the beginning. So another very interesting thing is that this huge transformation from a new university where Pakistan turns out to be relatively a helpful vice chancellor in taking forward students' demands to the present day where we have Jagdish Kumar yeah. would rather from whatever you have seen in your Yeah, but that's not an isolation uh, happening to JNU alone. Yeah. You see, uh, it's the nature of the uh, state and government has undergone a transformation, you see. And what you have is a, a clear illustration of what happens when Hindutva becomes the reigning ideology, you see. And Hindutva authoritarianism comes into play, you see. Because they have to control and dominate uh, the universities that is the ideological space, you see, which they, they have not been ever able to dominate naturally through their ideological superiority or through their intellectual, you know, power or intellectual resources. So the only way can, they can do it is use state power to coerce and control universities and therefore the students also, in the students and teachers, you see. And, uh, uh, you saw th it happening first in all the central universities, uh, whether it's JNU, whether it's Hyderabad Central University, whether it is the Pondicherry University and uh, so on. Because they, that is directly run by them, controlled by them, not the state-run uh, universities. But that sets the tone and it is happening in all other uh, education institutions of higher education, research, cultural organizations or institutions which the central government is controlling <coughs> they are doing a makeover of all these institutions and one way of doing it is to pl place people at the helm of these institutions who will do the bidding you see uh, there are two types of people they are appointing one is those who are rss they are hindutva hardcore you know followers or those opportunist elements who say, we'll do whatever you want us to do. If you give us this job, we'll do your bidding, you see. We, we, we have no, you know, uh, scruples or any integrity regarding this matter. So, one type of people, they are pointing uh, their own hardcore people and the other is those opportunists who have jumped onto the bandwagon saying, we'll do your bidding. And through that, they are trying to bring about this uh, restructuring and the weakness is because uh, in India the uh, nature of the uh, universities and uh, the autonomy of universities has always been a fiction. <laughs> in the state-run universities also basically we know what type of vice chancellors and this has been going on not now. In our time we, the joke was uh, police officers are becoming vice chancellors, Madhya Pradesh, etc. They used to appoint police officers. Way to control the law and order situation in the university because also the elements used to be there. And in some universities, it had become a den of anti social elements, criminal. So that was used as an excuse. So a retired police officer would be the ideal vice chancellor. But now it is more insidious. It is not just to uh, police them in the law and order sense. It was to police you intellectually and academically to bring about uh, uh, uniformity uh, which falls in line with what Hindutva wants, you see. So that, that's a problem with JNU is facing. You see. And JNU is specially targeted because JNU was the exact opposite of what this was so far, you see. So it's, it's, it's the most visible first target for them because if they can fix JNU 
from their point of view, then they, they, that example is enough to settle many other things for the rest of the you know, setup, the education setup. So there's this whole idea of uh, populism in student politics, you know, in doing certain things that would attract the masses perhaps more. Uh, what from whatever we have studied about earlier movements or seen that the emphasis was much more on the newer ideas of the thinkers, free thinkers or philosophers all over the world. But from there we have suddenly seen a shift towards giving more emphasis towards cultural and symbolic dimensions of certain things rather than uh, theorizing about them. So, you know, uh, you all have been stalwart leaders of anti-emergency movement, yet the kind of spectacle that revolves around someone perhaps very much new as Kanaya Kumar, someone who is pretty much new in the field of politics and all. Do you think that the reason student politics is somehow not being able to connect with mass movement outside campuses as a large is because we have lost the way of articulating that we cannot connect with the masses anymore, we require a huge spectacle or show only then are we able to connect with the masses. Otherwise our academic language usually prevents us from connecting outside campus. No, I, th I think uh, if you look in totality, yes, the whole scene has changed in terms of the uh, ideological and political framework in which we did politics say three or four decades ago you see that vast change has taken place and that change comes uh, from the late 80s and early 90s these twin processes one imperialist globalization and the second the fall of the Soviet Union and the retreat of socialism you see that brought about uh, a change, you see, uh, basic change and the way politics is articulated, the type of politics which is now utilized by the ruling classes to uh, mobilize people or uh, acquire support, all that has changed. Uh, you mentioned the populism, but you see the populism is very much connected with identity politics also, you see. Uh, the, the whole in my time, if you ask somebody, talk about identity politics, you'll get a blank look. Nobody asked, what is identity politics? The word identity politics did not exist before the 1980s. You see. Uh, it's not in the lexicon of anyone. Really. <laughs> it came because of this, uh, what do you call, uh, decomposition of the old. Out of that came when the universalist you know, outlook and ideologies retreated, it was filled by this identity politics and this whole host of identity politics. And th that identity politics further fragments, you see, it does not unite, you see, people. Uh, in that situation, if anybody can transcend that with some radical look, uh, posture and uh, speech, uh, it finds attraction probably, uh, but it, problem is many in the for us on the left, we can't cater to this identity politics. You see, it's very easy. You can always uh, acquire mobilize some support and acquire votes, especially electoral politics through identity politics. But it will be self defeating because it will then you become something else. You you're no more left. You see, uh, uh, so. That, that difficulty exists. I think it is not uh, because JNU or other places are, uh, you know, sort of exclusive or elitist. It's just that uh, the language and the nature and type of politics has changed, you see. And that's one of the challenges the left is facing, not only in India, but around the world also, you see. Uh, all this so-called populisms, uh, their fuel behind, behind it you will find is some form of identity politics. It may be race, it may be uh, 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 religion, it may be ethnicity, but you'll find that uh, it is th this is what thrives today. You see, and uh, the politics of 
uniting on the base of class identity uh, it's become more difficult today this is something which is i think not uh, challenge faced by, by any specific party or individuals or any campus it is much wider okay. since we are talking about identity politics uh, we have fairly had a lot of criticism of organized left with regarding their equation they share with the ambedkarite or caste based groups and how sometimes there have been turmoils between the so called red or the blue camp but through movements like uh, the justice for rohit and all we have seen that how these two camps or these two so called apparently different discourses have come together and they have been able to carve out a common path to certain extent but we still see a lot of cynicism on both the sides regarding a common uniting path against particularly in this fascistic panchayats so how do you visualize a sort of you know lal salam and Uh, Jai Hind slogan together in this present context. You see, uh, in vast parts of India, uh, this is historically true. Uh, the two streams, what you want, what you might say, Dalit politics. The, the, nobody used to talk about Dalits 30, 40 years ago. But what is Dalit politics or politics, which concern dalit communities and the left movement was uh, the, there was a gulf and a gap and it was problematic and there were tensions uh, because as i said uh, uh, the left has a more universal approach embracing all sections so we try to find out what is common between all sections to bring them together uh, while in the unique social structure that we have in india uh, caste is something which is very not amenable to 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 this universalizing appeal you see so gradually what's happened is we have realized that these barriers are there it's real you see we've been trying to see that these barriers are overcome so now we have a, i think we have a more nuanced and better understanding that we have to recognize that this barrier is there and how to work your way around that barrier rather than just pushing against the barrier finding this barrier is there and then saying go back and say this cannot but this barriers are there not because of only the nature of dalit politics we may have criticisms about the nature of dalit politics on dalit politicians what they do all that uh, but it's much deeper than that that dalit politics is arising precisely because of this the caste segregation and caste uh, uh, inequitous caste structure so uh, for us from a class standpoint your this is a barrier to your linking up and organizing some of the basic classes who are exploited and oppressed you see one section is you know that barrier has existed so we have always cursed this barrier uh, and railed against this barrier but not i think done had been doing enough to how to circumvent or get across around this barrier we have started that now in the recent years and it is yielding results but at the same time uh this right wing politics and right wing hegemony which is being established they are also working at this you see uh, they are also you you will be surprised that contrary to what common observation the bjp got maximum support among dalits in different parts of the country yeah if you see the electoral trends pattern they are reaching out to the dalits with their regressive ideology but they are able to make headway because uh they 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 know how to do that in a way to establish a pan hindu identity accommodate them but basically again without disturbing the caste structure now th that's another th immediate challenge we have to face so that shows the necessity for us to continue with our efforts uh and there was to 
overcome this barrier because we have to recognize why they feel they need to have a separate identity you see uh, much of it is a matter of basic survival you see uh, we say no the separate identity is bad for you you can't fight this alone but why they need to have the separate identity must be understood and then we have to we, we, we can find common ways to get together and work which I think slowly it is developing uh, in, in many places so there have been very much deep-rooted ideas in student politics which have progressed one after one another and the present time actually sees the culmination of all these ideas when they are pitted against one another in a small space of shrinking democracy. So I would like your commentary on that. Pitted against one another? It's like they are all not pitted against one another, they just throw it into one small space and it's like everything has come out together at a boom because of the kind of overwhelming structure probably we are functioning in, whereas we are being suppressed from yeah, every let, other Let me unpack what you have said. First thing is, we must understand that all student movements have not been progressive. There are regressive movements. The progressive movements. There are movements for change and reform and there are movements to defend the status quo. That is why I said that ideological stream, uh, the ABVP, it's a regressive force to the students. Uh, it fosters a false nationalism, it fosters a false pride in all that is regressive in Indian society etc etc and you have student movements based on certain narrow identity politics uh, which has been actually disrupted and divisive if you make uh, another part or section of society which are equally oppressed your main enemy and not direct your movement against the ruling uh, classes and the establishment, then you are playing a very divisive way actually. So I don't hold that all these student movements have been going step by step progressively forward. And more and more you will find student movements now cropping up, which in this atmosphere, which you have to clearly demarcate or differentiate from. The present uh, <coughs> If the main direction of a student movement is not against this Hindu authoritarianism and this fascistic attacks and how it affects the lives of people and if it diverts to some other thing. So don't you, you, and you, if you put the space is shrinking but you are pitting each other with such movements then we will be only frittering away our energies. We have to see the main thing and lose not lose sight of the goal of the main thing and try to unite uh, different students, movements, organizations, irrespective of our, there may be serious actual problems and differences, but as long as they are not part of a regressive force and they are not going, to, they are working towards uh, divisive reactionary goals, uh, we have to overcome that and unite with them. So it's, I think the challenge is more that. How do you bring different streams in a situation where increasingly you will also find uh, students who will remain apolitical, you see, who do not want to be involved in any of this, which sees this as something uh, abnormal. You see. Uh, how do you bring them into any democratic activity? You see. That's going to be also a major challenge. Uh, gender was not a major issue, frankly. Uh, it became uh, after my time, that's why I am saying, I am talking about my time strictly. That's only 1970s, the whole decade of the 70s. There was the initial stirrings. Uh, feminism had become a issue or a movement in the West uh, and also that is impact on the student movement in the West at that time. Here, yes, in the sense that the early issues, for example, uh, 
gender, this uh, thing in the admission system was not then our thing. Now it came later. Uh, though women students benefited from this uh, scheme because if you were from a social, uh, socially and economically deprived background, you had also a better opportunity to come. But not specifically because of uh, gender. But overall, it had. we definitely took up some issues uh, which were of concern. For example, uh, timings in the hostel. Uh, a very interesting debate on that. You see, the university had some very interesting professors in that time. Uh, the demand was the same timings as the boys' hostel. I don't know if you remember that at that time. So it was 10 o'clock, women should also, hostel should be 10. It was 8 o'clock, say. So we supported that demand. So then, Dean of Students Welfare at that time, uh, he, had a, he was a trade union leader earlier in his old days, etc. He called me and said, you are fighting to say that a small town, from a small town in UP, the girl should come to jail. You are saying, you know, bring such to If their parents hear that there is no timings in the hostel, they will not be allowed to come. You keep that in mind. I thought it made some sense. So I, I sort, of, sort of sought a compromise that the timing will be, you know, what they, now it's 8 o'clock, make it 9, not 10 or something. I was criticized for that by some of the women's students. Said you are one of them. Sent me a note saying you are a male chauvinist pig. <laughs> I remember that still because I didn't approve, agree to the no timing at all. There will be some time, but I was struck by that thing that keep you are trying to bring people from various backgrounds. Those days, you know, family parents would be having a say, sending a girl out to a place like Delhi. So, it should not appear that this university is got that type of social mores or values which are required. So, we worked out. But there were such issues were coming up at that time. So, we will wrap this yeah. up today with the last question. Yeah. So, there, it has been a huge journey on your part from being a student activist to being a modern political member of CPI. How would you contribute? Like, what, how much would you give GNU and your student activity? I, I must confess life? that I was politically active or politically uh, aligned before I came to GNU. In the Edinburgh entire No, no, place. after that also. Uh, I must confess that my coming to JNU was not for actually doing student politics. I, I came to JNU because I had to be in Delhi, because I wanted to do some party work. So that is the reason I had to give some explanation to my mother why I was going to Delhi. Because I was, it was, all, it was decided that I'll come and work with A.K. Gopal and Robert A.K. Gopal as his assistant basically, for his work. I was very happy to do that. But I needed some reason to come. So I said I'm going to join JNU. That's why I applied to JNU and came. And then when I got into JNU, uh, because I was there, then I got into this student. Because I, I, as far as I was concerned, I thought I'd finish my student career after my postgraduate degree. I'm not interested in continuing with my studies. But then I joined for PhD. I got a scholarship which helped me maintain myself. And then I did both work for some time. But then when I became the president of the union, then I got into student federation full time sort of work. Yeah. But it had, of course, it helped me the, the student activity and the work in the student federation of India definitely helped me to develop my political and organizational um, capacities. <laughs>